In today's discussion, we'll be covering Julian Barre syndrome. As always, we like to start off uh, our conversation by um, and our discussion by defining what the term or the disease that we're encompassing is all about. So Julian Barre syndrome is an autoimmune neuropathy which is confined to the peripheral nervous system and is associated with a past history of certain infections or certain um, illnesses, which I'll talk about in a moment. There are several variations of this disease. So it can uh, present as acute inflammatory demyelinating polyradiculopathy, and that's the most typical presentation, but there are other variants as well, such as acute motor and sensory axonal neuropathy. Acute motor axonal neuropathy is another presentation. Acute sensory neuropathy is another one. And also, interestingly, it can present with acute autonomic neuropathy as well. So from a pathogenesis point of view, as I've already alluded to, it's, uh, this syndrome is associated with a previous history of illness or exposure. So often patients can present with um, a past history of um, exposure to an infectious illness. Often the causative agents could be Campylobacter jejuni, Cytomegalovirus, but less commonly Epstein-Barr virus and also Mycoplasma pneumoniae. These patients can have a recent history of an upper respiratory tract infection or gastrointestinal illness, which sort of presents, uh, which fits the picture of you know for an infection with, for example, Campylobacter back to jejuni or mycoplasma pneumonia, for example. The underlying um, pathogenesis isn't 100% clear, but it's believed that the body reacts to uh, an auto or has an autoimmune response brought about by molecular mimicry um, of the organisms in question. So the organisms have structures that are similar to structures normally found in the body, and that instigates the immune system to mistakenly attack itself. In this case, inflammation targeting the myelin and axonal components. It is a self-limiting illness, and eventually remyelination and axonal regeneration occurs. But in the meantime, these patients can present with a number of symptoms, which I'll um, discuss shortly. So as I've alluded to, patients resolve, and in terms of signs and symptoms, they tend to peak at around two to three weeks of um, of onset, and resolution can take anywhere between four to six weeks. These patients can present with weak, weakness, which can range in spectrum, so it can be mild to severe, and that's the most common feature. It can be an ascending weakness, and it can be asymmetrical, usually affecting the lower limbs, and the weakness can be progressive, and occasionally can impact the respiratory muscles, and hence the patient's capacity to breathe. The patient can also present with sensory alterations, so numbness, paresthesia, abnormal sensations, for example. And again, that can start distally and progress uh, more proximally. Cranial nerves can be involved, so patients can present with facial droop, diplopia, double vision, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, and dysarthria, difficulty with speech. Autonomic alterations, as I've sort of alluded to earlier, can be a feature of this um, syndrome as well. So patients can be can experience orthostatic hypertension, bradyhypnosis, or tachycardia, and occasionally there may be um, pain features present as well. So in terms of diagnosis, the diagnosis is predominantly um, clinical based on clinical findings, but there are some differential diagnoses, uh, diagnoses worth considering. These include chronic inflammatory demyelination polyradicular neuropathy and it's believed that this is closely related to Julian Barre syndrome and it's considered perhaps the chronic counterpart of Julian Barre syndrome which is more acute in nature. Myelopathies can be considered spinal cord compression and perhaps psychiatric conditions can be uh, considered as well for example conversion disorders. Now that we've got the diagnosis out of the way let's talk about investigations. There are a number of key investigations that can be performed to um, help with the diagnosis of Julian Barre syndrome. The first and easiest, uh, I guess, would be um, looking at blood work, particularly performing a, um, tests that can reveal or that can screen for peripheral neuropathy. Things like patients' vitamin B12, folate levels, rheumatological pro- profiles, and including um, erythrocyte sedimentation rate uh, are important considerations. Because as you know, rheumatoid arthritis and systemic lupus erythematosus may present or have neuro, um, neurological features such as peripheral neuropathy. HbA1c, a marker for um, glucose glycemic control over the past three months, is also important as well because, as um, you guys may be aware, type 2 diabetes, particularly um, later advanced stages of type 2 diabetes, can present with peripheral neuropathy. And in about one third of patients with Julian Barre syndrome, they can present with abnormal liver function tests, so that might be a, um, a consideration as well. Nerve conduction studies can be performed. So looking at um, the presence of demyelination where you observe a slowing of nerve conduction and nerve um, conduction blocks as well. In terms of uh, the use of nerve conduction studies, two nerves should be affected to um, assist in the di- uh, assist in, um, in interpreting the nerve conduction studies. Lumbar puncture can also be performed um, where cerebral spinal fluid is um, withdrawn and it's um, analyzed. 
the CS uh, the cerebrospinal fluid can um, have high protein, which raises over time, despite having normal white blood cell count and normal glucose count. Oligoclonal bands may be seen where it's an indicator of immunoglobulin circulating in the body. And as I've mentioned before, based given the fact that you know, in severe cases, patients can have respiratory compromise, performing pulmonary function tests is another consideration as well to monitor the patient's respiratory function over the course of their illness. In terms of treatments, um, as you can imagine, this can be quite a significant and, and quite a da- dangerous presentation. So a hospital admission is frequently considered to ensure that the disease has plateaus and is reversed uh, before the patient can be safely discharged and also enables the clinicians to monitor respiratory um, monitor patients for respiratory insufficiency. Pharmacological and medical approaches can encompass things like plasma exchange where you remove the order antibody circulating in the body and that can improve recovery time by at least 50%. Intravenous Im- immunoglobulins can also speed up recovery, and it's been shown to be as effective as plasma exchange. And really the choice depends on how hemodynamically stable the patient is. Interestingly, corticosteroids have not been shown to be effective in the management of Julian Barre syndrome, despite this condition being an autoimmune reaction. Deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis is another key consideration because as you can imagine, the patients are bed bound, they may not be able to mobilize as effectively, and that places them at an increased risk of developing thrombosis. And therefore, the use of anticoagulants can be considered. Ventilator support and in severe cases, ICU admissions are another potential um, approaches to management of patients until the patient uh, is on their way to recovery. But pharmacological and medical management aren't the entire approach. You can have non-pharmacological approaches such as physiotherapy and rehabilitation to help restore functional status of the patient and minimize any muscle de- degeneration over this crucial time period. Occupational therapy is important as well, again with rehabilitation and support, particularly when the patient is discharged home with ongoing residual deficits. Speech therapy is also another non-pharmacological approach because as I've mentioned before, these patients can present with um, difficulty swallowing, dysphagia, dysarthria, and it's also important to get the speech therapist involved to help with rehabilitation and support of the patient during this difficult period for them. So this brings the talk to an end. As always, if you guys have any questions um, or want to get in touch with us, visit our Facebook page, YouTube, as well as Twitter and email and our website, and let us know what you think of our podcast and our videos. We always love to hear from you guys.